Miis. Those quirky little avatars you made of you and your friends back on the Wii, that was such a huge part of Nintendo's identity. Yet, nowadays, it feels like they're disappearing, and it seems Nintendo's forgotten about them. Why are they being phased out? For a long time, Nintendo had tried experimenting with making some kind of avatar creator. It's one of Shigeru Miyamoto's ideas to create a game based around this, in some way. But it never really went anywhere. Mario Artist Talent Studio for the N64DD eventually brought this idea to life. However, the game didn't perform very well at all, and was hindered by its limited audience. Fast forward half a decade when the Wii was in development, Miyamoto wanted to have another go at this concept, and this time with the idea that these characters could be stored within the Wii remote, and would resemble some kind of Japanese doll. These doll-like characters would be implemented into three upcoming Wii games, Wii Sports, Wii Play, and presumably Wii Fit. However, there was no solid plan for how these characters' faces should look with one idea being that you could load a picture of yourself from an SD card into the Wii to be projected onto the character's blank head. It turned out that, coincidentally, at the same time that these Wii games were in development, a separate team at Nintendo was working on a DS game, where you could assemble faces by sticking different facial features onto a blank head. This prototype was eventually seen by Miyamoto, who realised that this concept was just what they had been trying to achieve for years, and it fit together well with the idea of a little doll-shaped character. So the two projects combined, and Miis went into proper development, with the project now being made for Wii games. At some point, late in the development of the Wii, it was decided that these characters could become one of the primary features that was built into the console itself, with the Mii Channel. The production of these Miis ended up spreading widely, with Nintendo employees worldwide sending photos of their faces and suggestions back to the development team, so that the customization could be as diverse and accessible as possible, so you'd hopefully be able to create a caricature of any human face. And so the Wii released, and of course went on to be a huge success and a global phenomenon, with Wii Sports and the Miis at the front of it. You can see why they were appealing. You could be an athlete from the comfort of your couch, along with your friends and family sitting next to you. The Mii channel itself became a big part of the Wii's identity too. It sat proudly as the second channel on the Wii menu, and the novelty of it made it basically its own game. From the beginning, Miis were quite a social thing in nature, and Nintendo pushed that in a few ways. As well as just being used in multiplayer games, creating a Mii up on the TV was also just a fun thing to do with friends. I always used to enjoy when someone new came around and would make a Mii of them together before playing games. The Mii channel included online functionality too, through Wii Connect 24. Separate from the main plaza where Miis hung around was the Mii Parade, where you could send Miis over to. The Mii Parade could fill up with other people's Miis from other consoles, and yours could be sent to them. You could even receive messages from Nintendo with special Miis that could join your parade. Miis were also featured in the Wii's free online apps, like the Everybody Votes channel and Mii Contest channel, where people would have to try and make the best Mii to match a theme. Going back to the game side of things, Miis were pretty much everywhere, and appeared in basically every other Wii game. They were a popular thing to add to party games as playable characters, like Mario Kart Wii and Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games, as well as third party games that featured their own Mii-like characters, like Go Vacation. Who'd want to play as one of those characters over a Mii anyway? You could even play as Miis in games where they felt quite out of place, for example in Animal Crossing, where you could replace the expressive face of your villager with the blank stare of your Mii. In Sonic Colors, you could become some kind of half-hedgehog, half-man beast, and you could even play football as your Mii in FIFA. As well as being player characters, the Miis showed up elsewhere in games. A common thing was for them to replace your profile or save file. In Mario Galaxy, your file select screen can be a bunch of small planets in the shape of your head floating around. They'd also appear in the backgrounds of games as sort of easter eggs. What was cool was that the Miis that showed up in the backgrounds would normally be the ones that you created yourself. So the crowds in Mario Kart Wii could be made up of your friends and family, and a giant statue of Luigi could be replaced with a statue of you. Miis from Mii Parade even showed up, so people from all over the world could invade your games. I remember playing Coconut Mall a ton when I was younger, and I saw all my friends and family in cars, and I used to think that when a Mii was in a car, that person was actually driving in real life, because I was a dumb stupid six year old. So most of the Mii's appearances were actually guest characters in non-Mii related games, but what were they like in their own Wii series games? Well Wii Sports introduced a bunch of named Mii characters, who acted as the NPCs and CPU players of the game, and they'd be carried forwards into future Wii series games. The most well known Mii is obviously Matt, the boxing trainer and all-round Chad. I like how these Mii's are meant to be specific people within the Wii Sports world, rather than just randomly generated ones. I think they give the game a lot more personality and character, even though the Mii's themselves are hardly developed as actual characters. Alongside Wii Sports, Wii Play was also released, and while prominently featuring Miis, it wasn't really based around them. Not all minigames even had them playable, and it was really just meant to be a fun tech demo for the Wii Remote, with a variety of different games and control schemes. Wii Fit came next. You played as your Mii of course, but the mascot of this game was the Balance Board character. This game was, however, the first game to feature Woohoo Island, then known as Wii Fit Island. Wii Sports had a different location and world, those being a modern city and, for golf, a large wooded coastal area. 
It was kind of generic, and felt like it could be anywhere really, but Woohoo Island was the complete opposite. It had tons of different landmarks and recognisable locations, and had its own identity as a unique fictional world. The island had been seen before in a Wii Sports demo, though it didn't appear in the final game, and it was limited to just the setting of the jogging minigame within Wii Fit. As the series continued on, new games like Wii Music, where a band of Miis would play instruments together, and Wii Party, which was basically a Mario Party-like game with the Miis, were developed and released. Notably, Wii Chess was the only game in the Wii series with no Miis. Kind of a missed opportunity, really. It would have been really fun to cast your Miis as different chess pieces, dressed up in costumes based on each piece. Maybe even acting out attacks like in Harry Potter's Wizard Chess. It really would have set the game apart from other digital versions of chess. And then there was Wii Sports Resort. This was probably the biggest game of the original Wii series, and it sold incredibly well, including better controls and a bunch of new sports and modes. I'd even consider it one of the best party games ever. This game had the unique theme of a sports island resort, which really ties the whole game together. It's the most developed version of the island that we've seen, and the game really embraces it and truly brings it to life. Every sport in the game takes place here and in the surrounding area. In the background, you've got Mies just wandering around, living their lives and either participating in or viewing the sports. And there's a bunch of things that aren't necessarily sports related, like ancient ruins, a cruise ship, and a volcano, but they just add to the setting so much. It's all brought together really well in the modes where you get to traverse across a large area, like cycling and water sports. And of course, there's the island flyover, the most iconic mode that lets you freely explore the island and it's so much fun. I used to love just flying around and imagining what life would be like for the Mies there. Nintendo didn't need to put so much effort into building this world, but they did, and it's so much better for it. It really stands apart from its predecessor. Mies were the icons and identity of the Wii series, however the gameplay itself didn't really focus on them. Of course, they were the main characters, but really they just could have used Mario characters, and it would have still been the same gameplay-wise. So what if Mies were the core focus of a game? and a proper game, not just a mini-game like the Mii Contest channel. Well, Nintendo thought of that, and created the Tomodachi Collection on the DS. This game was a Tamagotchi-style life simulation, where your Miis live on an island and take care of your needs. The DS didn't have its own dedicated Mii Maker, so one had to be included in the game to accommodate it. A few other DS titles went on to include Miis, and also let you import the ones that you already had on your Wii. However, all but a fitness trainer game ended up being exclusive to Japan including the Japanese Tamagotchi collection, unfortunately. It's funny that the console that the Miis were born from hardly featured them at all in the end. Miis appearances weren't just restricted to the Wii and the DS. In official Nintendo interviews on their website, developers would be represented by their own Miis. I've always found it cool to see the personal Miis of Nintendo employees, and this was taken even further in the future. Of course, with the popularity of Miis, there were going to be clones and knockoffs. I've already mentioned the ones that appeared in third-party Wii games, but the most notable Mii clones were made by a certain computer company. In 2008, Microsoft introduced Xbox avatars, which were developed by Rare. These were used just like Miis, being made on the console and used in a variety of casual games. Rare denies that they copied the Miis, and the avatars were supposedly in development before the Miis were even announced. I'm not going to say that isn't true. But from the final designs of them, I think it's pretty obvious that they took some inspiration. The facial features look really similar to the simplistic style that the Miis used. However, I think that the more realistic head and body shapes just don't work that well with the faces. It looks off. It's like they just copied the Miis without any of the charm. To their credit, having the option to customise clothing is cool, and does set them apart from the Miis a bit more. And I will say that these original Xbox 360 avatars look a whole lot better than their newer, extremely generic counterparts. So Miis were a huge deal throughout the Wii generation, and this era was definitely the peak of their popularity. They were mainstream thanks to the massive success of the Wii. It felt like everyone had played on a Wii at that time. Even people who didn't own one, or didn't have much interest in gaming. It sold 101 million units, and with it being a social and family-oriented console, it's possible that hundreds of millions of Miis were made, based on real people. Their simple designs and wide amount of uses made them work so well for the Wii, and they became some of the main icons of Nintendo, up there with Mario and Link. In some ways, they surpassed Mario in representing Nintendo, because they weren't limited to a specific game franchise. It just wouldn't make sense giving up on them when moving into the next generation. And so Nintendo went in strong with the Miis in their next pair of consoles, the 3DS and the Wii U. The 3DS launched in 2011 and brought with it its own brand new Mii Maker. These included some new customization options, as well as a function that allowed you to take a picture of yourself, which could then be turned into a Mii. Unfortunately, it didn't really work well. The results were quite funny though. Being on a handheld console, you couldn't really mess around with your friends making Miis on the TV, but it was still perfectly fine. It also had another camera function of being able to scan QR codes to import Miis, which was actually pretty cool. 
The console launched along with only a small number of Nintendo games, but the Mii Maker did not go to waste. Instead of making a brand new Wii series style game for the 3DS, Nintendo took two pre-existing series and turned them into Mii games. Kind of. Nintendogs was a massive hit back on the original DS, so it made sense to make a proper successor for the 3DS. The player character in those games was just real life you, interacting with the digital dogs, and a few other characters in the game appeared as portraits of realistic humans. However, in the 3DS sequel, all humans were replaced by Mii's, which was an interesting decision. The game was meant to look real, and having Mii's alongside realistic dogs just seems odd. The thing is, Nintendo wanted to actually show people in game as 3D models, and realistic humans probably would have looked atrocious on the limited hardware. And in my opinion, it just wouldn't feel Nintendo-y. I think Mii's work well enough, and it helps give the game more opportunities than it would have had with actual player models, especially when it came to interactions with other players. The other Mii game on the 3DS was Pilot Wings Resort. This game is strange. It is a Pilot Wings game. The gameplay, structure, and music are all the same as they were in Pilot Wings 64. But instead of building upon the world and characters of that game, they're replaced by Mii's. And the game takes place on Woohoo Island. So in some ways, is it more of a sequel to Wii Sports Resort? It feels like an expanded version of the Air Sports mode from that game, which is a good thing, but it's just a bit confusing. Was it originally planned as a new Pilot Wings game? or Island Flyover 3DS Edition. The game's title suggests both. Woohoo Island here is pretty much the same as it was before, and it doesn't really introduce that much new to the Mii universe. And hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Neither of these games were revolutionary in terms of gameplay, or their use of Miis, but the 3DS did launch with another kind of game that kind of did both. The 3DS was packed with a bunch of free software that came pre-installed on the console. Face Raiders, augmented reality games, and most notably, Street Pass Mii Plaza. Street Pass was kind of the 3DS's answer to the online social features that the Wii had and the DS didn't have. Except, instead of being based around online connections, it was based around local interactions in real life. I think the concept of it is really cool. You take your 3DS around with you when you go out in public, as you do with a handheld console, and it will connect to the 3DS of anyone else who's doing the same thing nearby. Connecting with another person would earn you rewards in games, as well as unique player content being shared between you, like Mario Maker levels. A ton of games supported it, but the main one was of course the Street Pass Mii Plaza app itself. Within it, you'd have your own Mii set up, and anyone you street passed would have their Mii join your plaza. You could then take their Mii with your own into the different small games that were available, with their Mii helping you progress in some way. These games mostly featured some kind of collection mechanic. You could build up an army of other people's Mii's, or fill out jigsaw puzzles with the pieces they'd give you, among other things. And the main collection was the plaza itself, full of different Mii's from all over the place. You could see what country they were from, and what their favourite game was too. Sometimes, special Mii's could be sent over the internet from Nintendo, so you'd have a Nintendo employee in your plaza, which helped make it feel like a cooler, expanded version of the Mii Parade on the Wii. A downside compared to that version is that they don't appear as your own cast of Mii's like on the Wii within games, but I'm not sure if the 3DS had many, if any, games that worked like that anyway. One description I've heard of Street Pass is that it's kind of like a secret club that only 3DS owners are a part of, and it's quite accurate. It's a shame that Nintendo never brought it over to the Switch. Similar to the Wii, Miis would show up as playable characters as such in various games, and there were a few more games that ended up starring Miis for the first time. Pokemon Rumble World, which was the sequel to a WiiWare game, had your Mii sending off a toy Pokemon to battle, and the story mode in Mario Golf World Tour has you playing as your Mii. It turns out that there's also one Mii game on the 3DS that I'd never heard of before making this video. <laughs> it's called AKB84 plus Mii. No, AKB48 plus Mii. Sorry. And it's a game about your Mii joining a real-life Japanese pop group. It wasn't made, nor was it published by Nintendo, but there are Mii's right there on the box, and you play as one. So technically it's still an original Mii game, I guess? It looks like there are other games based on this pop group though, but nothing like this one. So I'm not sure if this would be classed as a Miified game or not. Weird. Over on the Wii U side, Mii's were integrated into the system itself more than ever before. On the Wii and 3DS, having a Mii was always optional, though they were required for some games to work. But on the Wii U, you have to have a Mii to use the console at all, because making one is part of the system setup. Your Mii would represent your user profile and be displayed on the menus. The Mii Maker here was basically the same as the 3DS's with new music, though it unfortunately didn't have a Mii Plaza for your Mii's to hang out in. Instead, they just stand on shelves. It's cool that you can post them, but this Mii Maker was actually the least interesting one at the time. However, the Wii U did have its own plaza full of Mii's, that being Wara Wara Plaza on the main menu. When you weren't connected to the Nintendo network, there were a bunch of Mii's standing around, talking about the various pre-installed software that the Wii U had, with you standing in the center. But when you are connected, those Mii's are replaced entirely. 
Miiverse. Miiverse was one of the Wii U's big new features outside of the gamepad. Nintendo took the idea of Miis being used in a social way to the extreme, and made a whole social media based around them. Almost every game would have its own community, where you could make posts and drawings for everyone to see. And quite often, they'd be integrated into the games themselves. For example, in Mario 3D World, Miis would stand around on the world map dressed as Sprixies and displaying things they'd posted. And in Wind Waker HD, you could find and send messages in a bottle with a Miiverse post written on them. There could even be private sub-communities within games. Wii Sports Club had one for each club, which were based on real-world regions. And if you made a tournament in Mario Kart 8, it would get its own community. No one ever joined mine, though. It's quite a unique way to interact with games and other people, being completely built into the system. Rather than having a profile picture, everyone was represented by a me, and it really helped give the feeling that you were part of a big community of Nintendo fans, rather than just faceless strangers posting whatever. Developers showed up on Miiverse too. Masahiro Sakurai would post his photo of the Day series on there, with screenshots of Super Smash Bros for Wii U, and you could find interviews and updates from other big name Nintendo employees too, like Shigeru Miyamoto and Eiji Aonuma, who all had their own accounts with their own personal Miis. You don't normally see these people posting on social media, so it was really cool to have some kind of way to hear from them that wasn't just Nintendo Directs or interviews with journalists. Third party developers could have verified accounts too. I remember the creator of some kind of B related game holding a drawing contest on there once. All of this stuff was great, but Miiverse was a pretty weird place. But that was to be expected. Anyone with a Nintendo Network ID could join, so it was full of children probably too young to be online, and Nintendo's rules were quite strict about people posting anything inappropriate or not game related. Back to the Warawara Wara Plaza, this was basically a limited capture of Miiverse, visualised as a physical space, where your Miis hung out and chatted, right on your main menu. The plaza was, like Street Pass, a sort of evolution of Mii Parade, since all the Miis are from other real Wii U owners, including your friends, and you could choose to download them to your own Mii collection, if the owner had given permission. The Wii U had some of its own Mii-centric titles. It launched with Nintendo Land, one of the best party games I've ever played, again. The game included different attractions that were all mini-games based on different Nintendo franchises. They all tried to use the Wii U gamepad in various cool ways, with the best ones having asymmetrical multiplayer, where the gamepad player works differently to others. Instead of playing as the actual characters from games, you play as Miis wearing themed costumes, and the whole game has a cool theme park aesthetic, where everything's clearly set up to be a game for the Miis. Instead of actual monsters, you have robots and puppets that look like them. The game's main menu had a hub that you could walk around, and here you'd have loads of Miis wandering around like a real theme park. There could be real people's Miis too, if you were connected to Miiverse, and they'd display their own Miiverse posts. After this, Nintendo continued to use Miis in their sequels to Wii series games. Wii Sports Club was sort of a remaster of Wii Sports, with online multiplayer and some new control methods, but it failed to have much impact, like, at all. This was probably due to the fact that most people probably had the original Wii Sports already, and Wii Sports Club had a weird payment model with day passes, and the sports being sold separately. The other games, Wii Fit U and Wii Party U, were perfectly fine successes, but that's all they were. Just sequels. The Wii U was already underwhelming for a lot of people, and having a few Just Another Me games didn't help. Miis did show up in other games though. They were playable where you'd expect, Mario Kart, Mario and Sonic etc, though their addition to Super Smash Bros was a bit more notable. For some reason, Reggie fils was a popular request for a Smash Fighter, so Nintendo added him, at least in Mii form, and you'd have to make him yourself. All fighters in Smash 4 had customizable movesets, but the Miis went even further. One, they were Miis, so they were completely custom anyway. And two, you could unlock different costumes for them. These just made it more interesting than playing as a basic Mii. And on top of that, there were costumes based on specific characters. So even if you couldn't play as Geno or Knuckles, you could at least make a Mii that looked like them, pretend you were playing as them. While the Wii U did embrace Miis just as much as the Wii in 3DS, the only completely original Mii game it got was Nintendo Land. And that was still just a game that starred them as characters, but not the focus, like Tomodachi Collection was on the DS. Back over on the 3DS it was another story. It got two of the best and most me-focused games ever released. In 2014, the 3DS received one of its most popular and beloved titles, the ultimate me game, Tomodachi Life. This was finally a sequel to Tomodachi Collection, and this time it was actually released worldwide. I think during this generation, Mii's were just taken for granted no longer the fun new characters that they were at first. But this game brought them back into the spotlight. The premise is the same as its predecessor, taking care of Mii's on an island. The Mii's look up to you like some sort of god, who helps them with their daily problems. But they also just get along and live their lives, having hobbies, jobs, and forming relationships with each other. This game gave the Mii's more personality than they ever had before. They aren't just the characters of the game, they are the game. The fun of them being Mii's is that they can be whoever you want. 
friends, family, fictional characters, celebrities, and the game was actually overviewed in a Nintendo Direct presented by the Miis of the Nintendo employees, with a whole island full of them. I wonder what kind of impact it would have had if the original game had released outside of Japan. A few years after Tomodachi Life came Miitopia. This game worked as a sort of successor to Tomodachi Life, but within a different genre. Miitopia is a fantasy turn-based RPG that stars Miis in every character role in the game. You play as yourself, and have a party of whoever you want fighting alongside you. All the NPCs can be customised too. They're all actual characters, but who they're being played by is up to you. The game can connect to the internet and automatically fill in all the characters with Miis made by other people if you want as well. As for the gameplay, it's pretty simple, but quite addictive. There are still very large elements of life simulation here, and the Miis in your party still have their own personalities and choices, like in Tomodachi Life, so you don't have to control them other than your own Mii. However, you still manage them, sorting out their needs, organising them, and helping them become friends, which boosts their teamwork and makes them stronger. This whole game seemed to come out of nowhere, and it turned out to be so, so good and full of creativity. When it comes to the Mii universe in the 3DS and Wii U generation, it had been developed slightly further, with a brand new cast of named Miis appearing in Wii U games and Woohoo Island was still used continually, appearing in Mario Kart 7, Smash Bros, and Wii Fit U. It didn't really get developed further though, but Tomodachi Life and Miitopia kind of filled in the need for a world for Miis to live in. So in general, Miis had a great time across the 3DS and Wii U, but Nintendo? Not so much. With poor sales of the Wii U, and Nintendo's relevance fading, they did something very unlike themselves, and started releasing mobile games, the first of which being Miitomo. Miitomo appeared to be a spin-off of sorts of Tomodachi Life. You had your Mii living in an apartment, it could talk, and it had the same personality types as in that game, but the actual gameplay was very different. It actually wasn't really a game, it was more of a social app. Your Mii would ask you a bunch of questions, you'd type in whatever answer you wanted, and then your friends could visit and see what funny thing you came up with, and vice versa. There was a bit more to it. You could dress up your Mii with a much more detailed outfit creator than Tomodachi Life. You could earn rewards with an arcade-style minigame, and there was a pretty decent photo mode for taking pictures of Mii's. The app had a section where you could find Mii's shared by others, and see answers to questions from strangers from all over the world. So it seemed like Nintendo was attempting to make another, hopefully successful, Mii-themed social media, but it just wasn't good enough. The idea was unique, but not appealing enough to keep people sticking around, and it ended up being the first of Nintendo's apps to shut its servers down. The launch of the Nintendo Switch in 2017 set a bad precedent for the future of Miis. The Mii Maker was no longer a prominent app, and was buried in the system settings. No music, no plaza, pretty much just a bunch of menus. Along with this, Miis were no longer a requirement. You could use them as your profile picture, but it was completely optional, and that was the only thing you could do with your Mii on the system. The Switch launched with three Nintendo games, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, Snip Eclipse, and 1-2 Switch. Zelda and Snip Eclipse had no space for Miis, obviously, but 1-2 Switch? That game was the Switch's Wii Sports, or Nintendo Land, and was just the kind of game that Nintendo would normally put the Miis in. It seemed pretty clear that they wanted to go a different direction with their new casual party games, and 1-2 Switch was quite minimalistic visually anyway, so there wasn't much place for Miis. In the Switch's first year, Miis only appeared in two games, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, which was a port of a Wii U game, and Joy Sound, a Japan exclusive game, and again, a port. Worst of all, Miiverse shut down in October of 2017, leaving the Wii U a much more lifeless console, with many in-game features made unusable. However, not all hope was lost. Miitopia released worldwide this year, a year after its original release in Japan. This was only on the dying 3DS though. In July 2018, Miis finally reappeared in Go Vacation, which was ported from the Wii to the Switch. It wasn't until December of that year, around two years since their last appearance in a brand new game, that they resurfaced in Super Smash Bros Ultimate. Unfortunately, this still wasn't a sign of Miis staying relevant, as it was pretty much mandatory for them to be included, since the game was bringing back every single character playable in the series. It's like saying F-Zero is coming back because Captain Falcon was there. Around this time, it felt like Miis were completely done for. Nintendo was clearly trying to phase them out, and they probably wouldn't be making any noteworthy new appearances in games. The main reason theorised is that Nintendo just wanted to distance themselves from anything representing the Wii era of games, because of the failure of the Wii U. It made sense, Miis weren't even the only thing gone from that era. Nintendo moved on completely from the Nintendo network over to Nintendo accounts and Switch Online. The Switch's UI lacked most of the Nintendo charm most people associate with previous consoles, and even Amiibos were appearing less and less. It's possible that Miitomo was an experiment to see how the general public would react to Miis in 2016. Maybe the game would be a huge success, and they'd once again be mainstream. But since it failed too, that might have been enough proof to Nintendo that Miis were outdated. By now, it was clear that Miis were dying, and slowly becoming a relic of a bygone era. But then, they came back. 
Mii's technically appeared in Super Mario Bros U Deluxe at the beginning of the year, but this was only in the side mode of a Wii U port. Where they really came back was with Super Mario Maker 2, not actually playable this time, but a big part of the game. With the original Mario Maker, Miiverse was very well integrated into the game. All your levels would be posted there, and comments on levels would appear there too, since your Mario Maker and Miiverse accounts were the same. It was a good place to share and discuss levels, as well as hold level building contests and stuff, which gave the game a massive online community. The Switch didn't have Miiverse, so Nintendo had to sort of bring it back here. This wasn't even the first time Miiverse sort of returned either. In Splatoon 2, you could post drawings to be displayed in the game's hub, like in the first one, with Miiverse's years being replaced replaced by a fresh button, but it didn't work as well. The posts were only posted to Twitter or Facebook, so you couldn't actually respond to them on the console, and there was no way to really find a post you were looking for, anyway. In Smash Ultimate, the ability to share content like Mii's and Stages Online returned, and within the Switch Online app, you could view them in a sort of social media format. Even Yair's returned, but no comments. Anyway, in Mario Maker 2, you had to set up your own profile which was unique to the game. This meant having a unique username and a mandatory Mi to represent you. The pseudo Miiverse was the comments. Same as on the Wii U, you could comment on other people's levels and they would appear in the levels themselves, with them being tied to your profile. Disappointingly, that was it. There was no good way to respond to people after they had commented on your level. And if you wanted to share and discuss levels properly, it would have to be done on a separate social media. On the plus side, your Mii wasn't just an icon anymore. It was an actual 3D model, and you could work to unlock different outfits and poses for it, which would then show up on your profile, and whenever you played online multiplayer. Despite their significant appearance in Mario Maker, Miis didn't really return to the level they were on before. Just a few months later, Ring Fit Adventure released, which was the Switch's answer to Wii Fit, except in the form of an RPG, instead of a minigame collection. It actually reminds me of Miitopia in a lot of ways, but, you guessed it, this game didn't have Miis. Instead you play as a pretty generic, slightly customizable avatar. Like 1-2 Switch, this game would surely have featured Miis in the previous generation, but it just didn't here. It took its own direction instead, with a unique art style and set of characters. The roughly two year period following Mario Maker actually had a total of zero new games with Miis. Their only relevance came in the form of new costumes in Smash. Even there, some of these costumes just outright obscured the Miis from view, so it felt more like you were replacing them. It's not like they just wouldn't fit in any of the games from that period. Animal Crossing had them before, and so did Mario and Sonic, which both received new games. Clubhouse Games from the DS received a sequel during this time, and it would have been a perfect fit for the Miis. It even had bowling and golf, with golf courses from Wii Sports. To be fair, the original game didn't have Miis either, and since your Switch profile appeared in-game, technically you could at least see your Mii if you wanted. A port of Super Mario 3D World was also released, and it understandably removed the Miiverse integration. But still, the Miis in that game also worked like a sort of time trials mode, where you could race the ghosts of other players' Miis through levels, and that was gone too. So once more, it looked like the Miis were fading away. Until they weren't. Miitopia randomly got brought to the Switch, and this wasn't just a basic port either. It had to be reworked, just to use one screen and button controls. It had improved graphics, and included some extra content, like a horse that could travel with your Miis. It also added a big change to the Mii Maker. The first edition was wigs, which brought some more realistic and animated hairstyles to your Mii's, and the second was the makeup feature. This was basically a large collection of different shapes that you could arrange on your Mii's face, pretty much however you wanted. Using different colours and gradients, people were able to make some insanely detailed faces. Don't get me wrong, these were really cool, but it felt like many went too far, and they barely even resembled Mii's anymore. It kind of takes you out of the game seeing them next to normal Mii's. It's weird, this game had a big following online, and Mii's were technically relevant again, but a massive amount of them didn't really look like Mii's. Obviously it's still optional, but I think the best ones kept the basic style of Mii's, and used the makeup to just create things not possible with the normal features. Things like non-human characters, scars, and other unusual details that are important to the character. It seemed that this game might have been the beginning of the Mii's rebirth. Following on from Miitopia, Mario Golf Super Rush had a story mode campaign starring your Mii, much like its 3DS predecessor. And in November of that year, Pikmin became Miified, in the form of Pikmin Bloom. This wasn't the first Nintendo mobile game to feature Miis outside of Miitomo. They usually appeared as your user icon, thanks to the ability to assign your Mii to your Nintendo account. However, in Pikmin, your Mii is your player character, representing you on the in-game map as the leader of your Pikmin squad. You can unlock different clothing for your Mii, and there have been frequent updates and events adding new options. There was an exception to this resurgence. The new Big Brain Academy had its own avatars instead of the Mii's that its Wii iteration had. The fate of the Mii swung in the other direction yet again the next year. After five years, Nintendo had finally decided that the world was ready for a Switch successor to Wii Sports. I've been mentioning Switch games that felt like they should have had Mii's, but didn't throughout. But there's one game that feels the most important in this regard. 
Wii Sports was THE Mii game, the one everybody's played, and the world's introduction to Miis. Sure, the Tomodachi series is more focused on the Miis, but those games don't have nearly the same amount of recognisability that Wii Sports does. It was just such a shock to see that Miis had been replaced in Switch Sports. Some of the other games that I mentioned had their own forms of Avatar, but they weren't trying to imitate Miis, and they didn't really feel like they had any obligation to have them. But the Wii Sports series, and the Wii series as a whole, had only ever starred Miis, so the situation with these new characters, the Sportsmates, was different. They remind me of the Mii knockoffs that you'd see in third-party Wii games, an attempt to have their own thing, but just worse. The customization is more limited, it makes everyone have the same kind of face, no matter what different features you pick. Nintendo clearly was expecting a mixed response to the change, because Miis were thankfully still optional as player characters in the game. It was easy to miss this in the trailer, however, and after the game's official announcement, Nintendo's Twitter account confirmed to the inevitably upset fans that Miis were in fact still there. The main reason for adding new avatars was likely to make the game feel new to casual audiences, though I do wonder if it backfired on them, with casual players not actually recognising it as an official new Wii Sports game. Nearly two years on, Switch Sports is still the latest game to feature Miis. Their brief comeback across a few games was ended in a pretty disappointing way, being cast aside for some new characters. Although, not all hope was lost. An update to Switch Sports added a cheat code which turned all CPU players into Miis. They even added some of the original named Miis from the Wii. But it seems like there wasn't too much effort put in, as they weren't created with one-to-one -one accuracy compared to the originals. <laughs> it's the thought that counts. On top of this, Miis were added to Mario Kart Tour. It doesn't seem like much, as Miis have been in the last three Mario Kart games, but they made quite a big deal out of it. There was a whole event dedicated to them, with collectible Mii tokens and racing suits. Most recently, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe added a bunch of new Mii racing suits in its final update. There was no reason to this, and I doubt that many people even considered wanting more, but it does show that Nintendo still cares about Miis, to an extent. In fact, there's a few other little ways that Miis are being kept alive. Like I mentioned, you can have a Mii attached to your Nintendo account, and they'll appear in the My Nintendo website, whenever you sign in, play games, or when they offer reward coins. On the Switch's news app, there are occasional posts from the eShop team, who are represented by what I'm assuming are their own Miis. Miis even had a cameo in the Mario movie. When Luigi's phone is ringing, you can see the silhouette of a default male Mii, with its iconic pointy hair, who represents the unknown person calling Luigi. While these aren't all very important, they help keep Miis going as Nintendo icons. So what does the future hold for Miis? It's not very certain. The Switch generation had gone back and forth on having them appear in games, and it didn't exactly end on a high note. This generation was a whole new era for Nintendo, and a lot of changes came with it. I wonder how different the fast approaching Switch 2 will feel. In the last few years, we've seen Zelda take a proper new direction, and now Mario too, ever since the movie, and it's possible Nintendo will want to finally, truly distance themselves from the Wii era with the next console. But those small Mii inclusions do add up, and Nintendo definitely hasn't been ready to let them go. I think an important thing to think about is Nintendo accounts. Nintendo has stated that their account system isn't going anywhere, and will be continued to be used and expanded on in the future. And it'd be strange for them to suddenly remove Miis for no reason, even if it's the only thing. I don't see why they couldn't still be used as user icons on the Switch's successor. Personally, I expect that Miis will continue to exist in the state that they are now, at least for a while longer. Before Mario Maker 2 and then Miitopia, I wouldn't have been so sure though. It's a shame, as Miis have been a part of gaming my whole life. I grew up with the Wii, and a lot of my first gaming experiences involved playing as my Mii, so it would be nice for them to be more prominent again. It'd be even better to see a new Mii-focused game, whether it's a successor to Tomodachi Life or Miitopia, or something else entirely. Even Woohoo Island could return. We'll just have to wait and see. As always, thanks for watching, and subscribe for more.